Okay, in this lecture we're going to conclude our section 3.7 material on improper integrals. And in this last part of the section we're going to introduce a result known as the comparison theorem for improper integrals, which will allow us to determine whether certain improper integrals will converge or diverge by comparing the integrand with a simpler function whose convergence or divergence uh, could be established uh, very quickly, say for instance using the uh, p-test for improper integrals. So the following theorem is called the comparison theorem for improper integrals, and it says the following. If we have two functions f and g, which are continuous, such that f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, which is greater than or equal to zero, on the interval from a to infinity, then we have two possible conclusions. Uh, first of all, if the improper integral from a to infinity of f of x converges, then so does the improper integral from a to infinity of g of x. Now let's think about why this would be true, or try to illustrate our theorem here. So in the theorem statement, we were told that we had two continuous functions, f and g of x, which were continuous on some interval from a to infinity. And in the problem statement, or the theorem statement, we were told that f of x is greater than or equal to g of x. So that is the graph of f of x lies above the graph of g of x. So if we're considering the improper integrals of these two functions on the interval from a to infinity, our first part of this theorem says, well, if the improper integral of this f of x function, that is the larger of the two functions, from a to infinity converges, well, that means that the area under the graph of the function f of x from a to infinity uh, is finite. It's approaching some uh, limiting value, which is not infinite. So that would mean, of course, that the improper integral of this g of x function over the same interval which would represent the area under the graph of the smaller function, would also have to be finite uh, if the uh, greater uh, area is finite. So that means that the improper integral of that uh, smaller function would also have to be convergent. So one way that we might explain this is that the area under the graph of the smaller function, g of x, is less than or equal to the area under the graph of the larger function, f of x, on the interval from a to infinity. So if this larger integral is convergent, that is finite, that means that the smaller integral is also finite. <clears throat> now, a word of warning about this theorem uh, if the improper integral of f of x, the larger function, diverges, so that is if the area under the larger of those curves is infinite, then we cannot make any definite conclusion about the area under the graph of the smaller function, g of x. It could be infinite, it could be finite. We don't know for sure. Now, the second part of this comparison theorem says if the improper integral of g of x over the interval from a to infinity diverges, then so does the improper integral of f of x from a to infinity. So again, to illustrate this, let's consider the graphs of these two functions. Say f of x and g of x, which is somewhere beneath the 
graph of f of x on this interval from x equals a to infinity. So what this theorem is saying is if the area under the graph of g of x diverges, so if this shaded area under the graph of g of x is infinite, then if I consider the improper integral of f of x over that same interval, so that is if I add even more area, it would also have to be infinite. So we could say here, well, if the uh, larger, or if the uh, smaller of our two improper integrals, that is the improper integral of g of x from a to b, uh, from a to infinity is infinite, and the function f of x lies above the graph of g of x, well then certainly the improper integral, which is larger, would also have to be infinite. Now again, a word of warning about this theorem. Uh, if the improper integral of g of x, the smaller of the two functions, converges, we cannot make any definite conclusion about the improper integral of the larger function. So just because the area under the graph of the smaller function is finite, we cannot say anything about the area under the graph of the larger function from that. So this is why we call this the comparison theorem. We're comparing the area under the graphs of these two functions. So we know if the area under the larger is finite, the area under the smaller must also be finite or if the area under the smaller of the two is infinite, then the area under the larger curve must also be infinite. So let's look at some examples making use of this comparison theorem. Uh, here we are asked to determine whether the following integrals converge or diverge. And in part a, we have the integral from one to infinity of x over x to the fourth plus two dx. Now, we could try to evaluate this integral directly using a limit, as we did in uh, some of our earlier examples from this section. However, to evaluate this integral directly, we would have to be able to find an antiderivative of this function, x over x to the fourth plus 2. And none of the techniques uh, that we have... Um, will allow us to easily integrate this function. I think it can be done by making use of a substitution, but it's a little bit tricky here. Um, so if we aren't easily able to find an antiderivative of this function, let's think about what else we could do. So we could try to compare this integrand uh, to, uh, or compare this improper integral uh, to an improper integral that involves a simpler integrand and where we could determine convergence or divergence more easily. So what I might do here is make use of the following. Um, my function that I'm integrating is x over x to the fourth plus 2. Now I know that that function is uh, strictly less than the function x over x to the fourth uh, by itself. Um, so that is by adding two to the denominator of this function, well, I'm dividing by a larger quantity, which would give me something smaller than if that plus two were not there. So the improper integral from 1 to infinity of x over x to the fourth is even larger. And if I simplify this a bit, well, I've got the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x cubed dx. Now looking at this new integral, uh, how would I know whether this converges or diverges? Well, I could tell immediately uh, 
because this is an improper integral over an infinite interval uh, of the form 1 over x to the p power. So I could use the p-test for improper integrals to see that since this value of p is greater than 1, this integral must converge. So let's say the following. Since the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x cubed dx converges by the p-test with a value of p being 3 in this case. What well, we said, as long as that value of p is greater than 1, that improper integral converges. So since this larger integral converges, the integral that we started with, which was smaller than the uh, one that we just showed converged, must also converge. So I could say since the larger one converges, uh, the given integral converges by the comparison theorem. So we've managed to establish that this integral converges, uh, even though we didn't evaluate it, making use of a limit. We know that it converges by comparing it with a known integral. So let's look at another one. In part b, we have the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over, uh, or 1 plus e to the negative x all over x dx. Um, so again, we could try to evaluate this directly, but it becomes a little difficult to find the antiderivative of that e to the negative x over x term. Uh, so if we can't easily find an antiderivative for our function to evaluate this, how else can we determine if it converges or diverges? Uh, and the answer would be by maybe comparing this with a known integral. So for this one, I'm going to use the fact that the function I'm integrating here, 1 plus e to the ne uh, negative x over x, is greater than the function 1 over x on the same interval from 1 to infinity. So by adding that exponential term e to the negative x in the numerator, I get a larger value for my function than if I just had the 1 over x term. Now, the integral that I have here is a uh, integral of the form 1 over x to the p power, where the power of p here is equal to 1. So we know immediately from the p-test for improper integrals that this integral will diverge. So if this integral is infinite and we have an integral which is even larger, it must also diverge by the comparison theorem. So let's write up our justification here. We could say since the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the first power dx diverges by the p-test with a value of p being equal to 1, which is not greater than 1. Uh, the uh, given integral, which is even larger, must also diverge by the comparison theorem. All right, so we have that our integral is divergent even though we weren't able to find an antiderivative of that function to evaluate this in terms of a limit. So let's look at one last example in part uh, C. Uh, 
we have the integral from 2 to infinity of 1 over x plus e to the 2x power. Uh, so again, the tricky part here is if we try to evaluate this directly in terms of a limit, uh, we would have to find an antiderivative of 1 over x plus e to the 2x, uh, which is very difficult. So if we can't easily find an antiderivative, uh, then let's try to compare this function uh, with a function that's a little simpler. So based off what we had looked at in parts a or b, uh, we were trying to compare our function uh, with an improper integral uh, involving something of the form 1 over x to the p. So at first, I might try to compare this function with the function 1 over x dx. So I know by adding an exponential e to the 2x in the denominator, I would be dividing by a larger quantity, and I would therefore have a smaller value uh, for the function as opposed to just the 1 over x term. Um, now, what we have here, the integral from 2 to infinity of 1 over x dx, well, this is an improper integral for which we could apply the p test where p is equal to 1. Uh, now, if p is equal to 1, that means that this integral would diverge. This is going to have an infinite value. So the question is, what could we say about our original integral, which is smaller? And here the answer is, well, we can't make a conclusion. Just because the larger improper integral is convergent, does not necessarily mean that the smaller improper integral is convergent. It's only if we know the larger of the two is convergent or if the smaller of the two is divergent. Here we have the, sm uh, the larger of the two being divergent. So by using this comparison, we couldn't make any conclusion. So instead, let's try to compare this with another function. So instead of comparing with 1 over x, where we have no conclusion, let's try to compare this with the integral from 2 to infinity of 1 over e to the 2x dx. So I know that the given function is smaller than 1 over e to the 2x, because if I add that x term in the denominator, I would get a function which is even smaller. So let's try comparing with this integral. Uh, now this integral, 1 over e to the 2x from 2 to infinity, uh, we can no longer use the p-test to evaluate because it doesn't have the form 1 over x to the p-power. So to evaluate this one, we would have to make use of the definition of an improper integral we're going to take a limit as t approaches infinity of the integral from 2 to t of 1 over e to the 2x, or equivalently e to the negative 2x power dx. So let's see what this gives us. We have the limit as t approaches infinity of the antiderivative of e to the negative 2x, which would be negative 1 half e to the negative 2x, evaluated from 2 to t. So if we evaluate our antiderivative, we have a negative 1 half e to the negative 2t uh, minus a negative one-half e to the negative two times two, or e to the negative fourth. So as t approaches positive infinity, this first term, the exponential e to the negative two t, will approach zero, and we're left with one over two e to the negative fourth power, which is finite or this integral converges. So if we've established that this integral converges, uh, 
then the integral that we were given, which is even smaller, must also converge by the comparison theorem. So here we can say since the integral from two to infinity of one over e to the two x dx converges, uh, so does the given integral by the comparison theorem. All right, so we have that this improper integral converges. So this last one illustrating that um, if we initially try to compare our integral uh, to something uh, that's larger but diverges, uh, we might not be able to draw any conclusion at first, in which case we have to try to compare to another function uh, where we could establish the convergence or divergence. Now, in our last example for this section, we'll consider an interesting uh, sort of geometric application uh, or geometric problem that arises involving improper integrals. Uh, and we see uh, something that's... Um, a little perplexing. Uh, so this is a problem involving a, a solid known as Gabriel's horn. Um, so let us introduce it first. We will consider the solid, which is obtained by revolving the region under the graph of 1 over x on the interval from 1 to infinity about the x-axis. So this solid is referred to as Gabriel's horn. It's shown here. Uh, so if we take the graph of the function 1 over x from x equals 1 out to infinity, and we revolve that about the x-axis, we see that we would get this solid shown here. This is called Gabriel's horn. As we're moving out to infinity, so it keeps extending. Um, so... In part A of this last example, we are asked to find the volume of Gabriel's horn. So here, if I think about taking the region under the graph of 1 over x on the interval from 1 to infinity, and I slice that region up into little vertical slices uh, taken at a distance of um, x units from the y-axis, uh, where x is somewhere between 1 and infinity of a small width dx. Uh, if I revolve that strip about the x-axis, I see that I would have a disk shape. So to find the volume using disks, we would have pi times the integral from 1 to infinity of the radius of my disk, which is given by the height of our function, 1 over x squared, uh, times the thickness of our disk, dx. So we have pi times uh, the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx. And this is an improper integral since we have an infinite uh, interval. Uh, we're moving from 1 to infinity. So to evaluate this, we would need to define it in terms of a limit. So we have pi times the limit as t approaches infinity of the integral from 1 to t of 1 over x squared dx. So that would be pi times the limit as t approaches infinity of negative 1 over x evaluated from 1 to t. So this gives us pi times the limit as t approaches infinity of negative 1 over t minus a negative 1 gives us plus 1. And as t approaches infinity, this first term, 1 over t, will decay to 0. 
and we're left with a limit of one, uh, but not forgetting our constant of pi out in front of that limit, we would have pi uh, cubic units for the volume of Gabriel's horn. Now in part B of this problem, we're asked to find the surface area of Gabriel's horn. So let's recall our formula for calculating surface area. So the surface area of a solid of revolution is given by 2 pi times the integral over our x interval, which was from 1 to infinity. Uh, now, if we're revolving about the x-axis, uh, the radius of our little uh, cylindrical strip that we would consider is given by y, uh, which is the function 1 over x. And then we're multiplying by the differential of arc length, uh, which is given by the square root of 1 plus the derivative of our function. Now, the derivative of 1 over x would be negative 1 over x squared squared dx. So let's see what we have here. Simplifying this just a little bit, we have 2 pi times the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x times the square root of 1 plus uh, 1 over x to the fourth power dx. Now, evaluating this integral directly is uh, a little bit of work. Uh, but to get our conclusion here, I'm going to make use of the comparison theorem. So this function that I'm trying to find the antiderivative of is a little bit messy. Uh, but if I compare this with a simpler function, I know that this quantity is greater than 2 pi times the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx. So why is that? Well, if I'm multiplying 1 over x, by something of the form one, uh, square root of 1 over uh, 1 plus 1 over x to the fourth, I'm adding uh, to the square root of 1 this 1 over x to the fourth term. So for all values of x between 1 to infinity, I'm getting something even larger than 1 under that square root. So I'm getting something larger than if it was just the square root of 1 there, which would give me this 1 over x dx. So this new integral that I'm comparing with is an integral of the form 1 over x to the p, where the power of p is equal to 1. So we know that this integral is divergent by the p-test for improper integrals. So what does that tell us about the surface area? Well, if this integral that we were comparing with is infinite, then the surface area integral, which was even larger than this, must also be infinite. So we could say by the comparison theorem, uh, the surface area is infinite. So what we find here is we have this solid of revolution known as Gabriel's horn, which has a finite volume, but infinite surface area. Uh, so if we were con to consider this uh, Gabriel's horn as a physical object, it would be a horn that could be filled with a finite amount of paint since it has finite volume but it has infinite surface area, so the surface of it can never completely be covered. 